I inform the Senate that, at 8.30 a.m. today, eight proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Keneally. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. Withholding NDIS funds from the states is not an appropriate way to balance the budget. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Uh, Senator Billy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I'm pleased to speak to this MPI motion raised by my colleague, Senator Keneally. The NDIS is such an important reform for people with disability in this country. And quite frankly, I'm disgusted that the government, the Morrison Liberal government, is delaying the provision of essential services to people with disability just to prop up an artificial surplus. Those opposite really should hang their heads in shame. I've seen firsthand so many times how the services that are provided under the NDIS can make life better and more comfortable for people with disability, how it can give them dignity and assist them in day-to-day -day living. These people deserve a government that respects them, not who shortchanges them to reach their goal of a budget surplus. We've seen recently a letter by the New South Wales Liberal and Victorian Labor government to the minister responsible for the NDIS, Mr Stuart Robert, trying to access around $1.6 billion in funds that the federal government is deliberately withholding. Now, this isn't about politics. This is about doing the right thing. It's about the government doing the moral right thing. New South Wales and Victoria have governments from across the political divide, but they can see that the people with disability in their states and in other states and territories are being deliberately shortchanged by this Morrison Liberal government. Mr Gareth Ward, the New South Wales Minister for Families, Communities and Disability Services, said, and I quote, I want to make sure that the money doesn't sink, sit in a bank account offsetting the Commonwealth's budget, which is what, it is, which is what it's doing." End quote. And I agree. The money just shouldn't sit around in the federal government coffers in some kind of cheap accounting trick. It should be used to improve the lives of people with disability. We're still seeing tens of thousands of families with family members who deserve support being given the red tape run around, not being able to access modest, modest services to improve the quality of their lives. And in such a situation, to deliberately delay funds to meet an artificial goal of a temporary budget surplus is just plain cruel. We've also seen some serious allegations of fraud in the NDIS. It's yet another example of this government's mismanagement and incompetence when it comes to running its agencies. The government needs to investigate the alleged fraud and ensure that the NDIS funds are being put to good use because the government's failure to correctly administer the NDIS is impacting on the people who rely on it. The latest Council of Australian Government's quarterly performance report into the National Disability Insurance Agency's operations showed that in Tasmania, 67 per cent of participants rated satisfaction with the agency's planning process as good or very good. This isn't a particularly glowing figure, especially compared to two years ago, when satisfaction in Tasmania was at 97 per cent. Now, in Tasmania, my home state and your home state, Madam Acting De Deputy President, we have heard that there are widespread issues relating to disability transport and to the availability of NDIS-approved allied health professionals. The Joint Standing Committee on the NDIS held a public hearing in Hobart in October last year, and I'll just spend a couple of moments highlighting some issues that Tasmanian participants are facing. Our representatives of LIV told the committee, participants are scared of reviews too. We've had participants who've gone for a new commode chair, and all of a sudden their community access has been slashed by $20,000, completely unlinked. So you've got a group of participants who are terrified to go back, even though their plans don't meet their needs because of the negative experience they've had. Then they've had to go back for another review. 
And witnesses from the Office of the Public Guardian also outlined some key concerns. And I quote once again, there are unacceptable delays in the planning process. The delays occur in scheduling both initial and review plan meetings, in having plans approved, in sourcing service for plan implementation and, most importantly, for securing urgent reviews. There are inadequately skilled and experienced planners. Some appear to us to have a very limited understanding of the support needs arising from a disability and or a lack of understanding of cognitive impairments and the associated communications issues that will often accompany these kinds of impairments. The failure to provide for crisis services is certainly concerned from our point of view, and we consider that the NDIS really does need to improve contingency funding to be available for crisis when they occur and for clear procedures and processes to access funding and services. Provisions need to be established in response to crisis situations, but also for market failure situations, particularly for participants who have exceptional needs and challenging needs." End quote. So it's up to the government to start fixing some of the issues faced by my Tasmanian constituents instead of delaying payments to the states and territories to prop up their budget. By deliberately delaying these payments to the states, the Morrison government is shortchanging people with disability and denying them the care that they desperately need. They are causing unnecessary delay and unnecessary suffering. And we're talking about a government that's in, a third, it's in its third term. It's them. They're responsible. They shouldn't be callous. They shouldn't be petty and they shouldn't be downright mean when it comes to targeting vulnerable people, many of whom cannot speak Senator up for themselves. Senator Billick, your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Nobody could seriously question the Morrison government's rock-solid commitment to disability services, yet here we are. To see this issue being treated as a political football is quite simply offensive. But if Labor insists on inviting us to debate and defend our credentials in cleaning up the mess of the NDIS we inherited from the Gillard government, then Senator Keneally consider this speech my RSVP. The latest attacks on our funding commitments to the NDIS conveniently overlook seven years of hard work from the coalition to finish the job started by Julia Gillard with such undue haste. In the dying days of her government, she ordered the NDIS start from July 1, 2013, defying a recommendation from the Productivity Commission to start a year later. As the Commission later pointed out, the NDIS was like an aeroplane being designed in mid-flight. The MPI has no foundation whatsoever and proves a thorough lack of understanding on the part of the opposition about how the NDIS is funded and is just as ignorant about the purpose of the NDIS Reserve Fund. The government completely rejects any proposition it is withholding funding to the NDIS Senator. to the states or to the territories. The government also completely rejects that funds identified for the NDIS Reserve Fund is propping up its budget. The NDIS is fully funded on an ongoing basis for every participant Senator, Senator, meeting the eligibility requirements. Senator it's fully funded in a way that allows the Morrison government to build a strong economy and bring the budget under control. Full scheme funding arrangements that have been signed by the Commonwealth and every state and territory except WA clearly articulates that states and territories make a fixed contribution to the NDIS indexed at 4 per cent a year, and the Commonwealth will pay the balance of all NDIS costs, taking into account the contribution of all states and territories. Since 2013, the growth of NDIS participants has been commensurate with increased spending. In 2017-18, spending on the NDIS was $6.4 billion. In 2018-19, it was $13.3 billion. This year it will be $17.9 billion, and by 2021 it will be $22.2 billion. With the budget showing a $4.5 billion increase in NDIS spending next financial year, how can Labor claim a $1.6 billion cut? Labor, Labor is already guilty of cynically mischaracterising a highly technical budgeting issue known as an estimates variation. And now the deceit continues. 
Labor's claim that this is somehow under-resourcing NDIS is completely wrong and it's pure mischief. Once and for all, as the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Minister have stated repeatedly, the NDIS is fully funded. It's a demand-driven scheme. And if demand exceeds our estimates, the funding will be there. A point Labor's own Linda Burney was willing to concede on ABC Radio before the last election. When questioned if Labor would put more funding into the NDIS if elected, Shadow Minister Burney replied with this. There doesn't need to be a commitment. It's a demand-driven program. In 2019-20, there's been an $850 million increase, Senator Pratt, in funding through the individual plans of NDIS participants. This boost also reflects an increase in payments to service providers such as personal care workers, occupational therapists, physiotherapists and psychologists. An extra $400 million in extra NDIS funding has also been provided for administration costs and people supported under existing Commonwealth disability programs before their transition to the NDIS. Labor is in the scurrilous habit of lying about their funding of social programs. We recall their claims of Medicare in 2016 and four years later they're at it again with the NDIS. The NDIS is on track to reach 460,000 participants in 2020. Today, more than 338,000 people have been supported by the NDIS and have active, approved plans in place. Many of these people are kids being supported across areas ranging from health and wellbeing, lifelong learning to support in daily activities. Before the NDIS was established in 2013, Families placed an uphill battle to find coordinated quality support, and as the mother of a son with autism, I shared the pain of dealing with limited available services and expensive metropolitan best practice therapies. The introduction of the NDIS has been a great help to many families, including my own, who previously had little to no assistance. The NDIS is the biggest social and economic reform Australia has undertaken since the introduction of Medicare. The latest COAG Disability Reform Council performance report tells us 56 per cent of people on an NDIS plan identified with having autism or an intellectual disability. After my son's diagnosis, we were completely lost on where to find support and daunted by the prospect of having to scale a mountain of red tape before finding a pathway. Now, in my role as a senator, I again recognise the need to reduce the amount of red tape and make processes easier. I'm relishing the prospect of playing my own role in delivering long-term, sustainable improvements for many families living with disabilities across Australia. The Commonwealth and all states and territories which have signed up to full-scheme funding arrangements have agreed the objective of the NDIS Reserve Fund is to improve participant outcomes and manage scheme sustainability on insurance principles by using the Reserve Fund to manage the lifetime risk of participant supports. The NDIS Reserve Fund is designed to support participants over the longer term. Any suggestion the fund would be spent all in one go or provided back to the states and territories is just pure rubbish. The Commonwealth and all states and territories have signed off on an agreement to ensure using accumulated to, to establish the reserve fund using accumulated cash currently sitting with the NDIA. No government is expected to make additional contribution to the NDIS reserve fund. Accumulated cash set aside for the reverse fund remains in the NDIA's accounts and is not being used to balance the budget. The NDIS plan reaffirms the government's commitment to support people with disability to achieve their goals. The plan reaffirms the National Disability Insurance Agency's commitment to deliver world-leading NDIS to an estimated half a million participants over the next three to four years. The plan is all about establishing the NDIS onto a business-as-usual footing and long-term success. The plan focuses on quicker access and quality decision-making, increased engagement and collaboration, market innovation and improved technology, a financially sustainable NDIS, equitable and consistent decisions, improving long-term outcomes for people with disability, their families and carers. 
The government asked the NDIA what they needed to deliver, and we listened. The NDIA is currently filling an additional 800 APS positions capable of exercising delegations under the NDIS legislation, bringing the total NDIA workforce to more than 11,000. One of the key deliverables is the implementation of the Participant Service Guarantee. The independent review of the NDIS Act by Mr David Tune to inform the development of the guarantee has been complete and set the foundations to establish the guarantee. The government will use the findings to update and clarify the legislation and remove barriers to a better NDIS with a government response to be released shortly. The government's NDIS plan is already having a significant impact. There are now 338,982 Australians benefiting from the NDIS as at 31 December 2019, including 134,455 people receiving disability supports for the very first time, 40 per cent of the total number of participants. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants are up to 7.8 per cent. Culturally and linguistic diverse now represent 11.1 per cent of participants who received a plan in the quarter. The average wait time for children zero to six years to meet NDIS access has been reduced from 43 days in June 2019 to an average of less than three days in December 2019. The average time for children currently awaiting a plan has reduced from 104 days at 30 June 2019 to 44 days as at December, 31st December 2019. We are all in this together and, frankly, we owe that united front to people with disabilities who deserve so much more than having to listen to gratuitous, unfounded and feeble accusations from a Labor Party that deliberately ignores the truth. Senator Steele, John. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, when it comes to the NDIS, disabled people have, have watched a, a bit of a political blame game play out for a long, long time now. And while that debate has been going on, uh, we have been falling through the cracks and suffering. And I've got to say that as I listen to the contributions that have been made so far, I, I find myself deeply frustrated by the continuation of that blame game. The reality is, if you look at the history of the NDIS, there have been mistakes made on both sides. And there is an attempt now to cast uh, the contribution made as one side as the other as perfectly pure, when in reality uh, anything is further from, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Senator Hughes, in her contribution, um, talks about the rushed uh, nature of the scheme, that it was rushed into being. And there is some merit in that argument. It was rushed. I remember it. I remember campaigning for it. I remember looking at the timelines and thinking that they were very ambitious. But you've got to remember, you've got to remember why it was rushed. It was rushed into being because the Labour Party, because the Greens and because the disability movement knew that the Liberal Party wanted to kill it. We knew that you wanted to kill it because your advisers were out there saying, oh, it's a nice idea, but we can't quite afford it. Maurice Newman, head of Tony Abbott's Business Advisory Council, it's a nice idea, but not something we can afford. And so we knew that it had to be brought into being. Now, Senator Hughes talks about uh, demand, and this is something we hear from the government a lot. If there's more demand, there'll be more funding. Well, I tell you now, there is more demand, and that demand is not being met. The agency is being suffocated by the staffing cap which has existed upon it without reason now for the best part of 10 years. The institutional knowledge which has been lost in that time is profound. The waste and inefficiency caused by outsourcing to the private sector has been horrendous. 
and the outcomes for disabled people have suffered as a result. Disabled people know exactly what has happened to their scheme in the last six years, and that is that it has been under the management of a party that never really believed in it in the first place, but regarded it as a political third rail that they dare not touch. And so it has been passed from one incompetent minister to the next until it washed up with Mr Roberts. Now, the reality of the NDIS today is that it is letting far too many disabled people down. How do I know that? Because we keep dying. How do I know that? Because in the time that the NDIS has existed, the rates of abuse and neglect and isolation have not moved a jot. How do I know that? Because I spend so much time talking with my friends, advocates that work in the space, going through horrendous stories of people having to waste their lives fighting agency decisions through administrative tribunal processes just trying to get what they need, just trying to get what they are entitled to, just trying to get what they should be able to expect. And the real kicker in all of this is when you look at the structural underspending the scheme that the government is now using to prop up their budget, and I'll say it again really clearly, this government is balancing the books on the backs of disabled people. When you look at the driving causes of that underspend, it is not that people don't want services and supports, it's that they can't access them. If you are a deaf person in WA and you book 10 hours of interpreter support a day in your plan, and you have that in your plan for a year, you'll sit back down with your NDIA planner in a year's time and you won't have used half of it. Not because you decided you wanted to stay indoors, but because you can't access that much interpreter support in WA currently, because there is an absence of interpreters on the ground. Now, those kind of problems have been created by a fundamental lack of engagement in the disability space by this government. In fact, by both sides of politics, because here's the real the real essence of why this scheme is still so much less than what people need. Neither side of politics in Australia actually truly understand what disability is in 2020. There is still so much of a belief in a medical model of disability which puts the impairment with the person rather than a social model of disability which correctly identifies disability as the result of barriers in society created and sustained by ableism. And that lack of acknowledgement has led to an approach to this scheme which has fallen back into the old pattern of turning to somebody who asks for support and saying, Ooh, it's a bit too pricey, we just can't go that far. That attitude needs to change, but it can't change until the NDIS has the resources that it needs. And it ultimately can't change until everybody in this place takes their lead on the NDIS and every other piece of disability policy from disabled people. I thank the Chamber for its time. Senator Brown. Uh, th thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I want to say at the outset that the Labor Party will never resolve from putting this government uh, in the spotlight regarding the NDIS, because what is currently uh, the government is doing is wrong. They are banking um, money that is meant to go to the NDIS and to participants to prop up their budget. They are, that is exactly what they're doing. And to come in here and suggest that somehow it's a, an accounting um, 
process, and that's all it is, is just disingenuous. And it's quite downright insulting to participants of the NDIS their fa and their families, because we know, and each and every senator and member of the House of Representatives should know exactly what is happening out there in terms of the NDIS, because they should be getting the calls, they should be getting the emails of participants or their family members coming in to their offices, ringing, emailing uh, and coming in and asking for assistance, because they can't. If they've got a plan, they can't access the services or they can't get the equipment. They can't uh, uh, organise for somebody to come and give them uh, occupational therapy. The, there are huge uh, issues in terms of the NDIS and how it, it is being run. There's been a number of uh, issues that have been raised by the previous um, Liberal Speaker, uh, Senator Hughes, and I know Senator Hughes is well aware, well aware of some of the issues that um, that the NDIS uh, has has, which of course goes to the fact that there are delays, there are underspends, and she and we know why there are there are underspends. And we know why there are delays in reviews and delays in plan building, and that all, and that goes also to the fact that there is a staffing cap on the NDIS. Very easy for the government to remove that staffing cap. The government has been called on by numerous uh, disability advocates to please remove the staffing cap to enable um, staff to be put in place to, be, uh, to go through uh, the plan building and to, to um, reduce the delay that is currently um, happening in the NDIS. But it's fallen on deaf ears. Now, I don't know whether that's because we've had about six ministers in this critical area but in this government. Six ministers that just seem to hand it over from, as soon as they can. It's just not good enough. And as I said, as I said, well, it is true, Senator. As I said, as I said, as I said, the Labor Party will hold this government to account in terms of um, the NDIS, and we also, as this uh, MPI. Uh, states, we will hold them to account around the issue of withholding NDIS funds. Now, I, I want the Senate not just to take my word for it, but we know this is the view of both the Victorian and the New South Wales state government. The federal government wants to hold on to the $1.6 billion worth of funding for the NDIS to try to make their books balance, despite the many people with disability throughout Australia that desperately uh, need the money spent on care and support. Now, the New South Wales Minister for Disability, Mr Gareth Ward, and of course um, he, uh, he is a Liberal minister, he has said, and I quote, I want to make sure that money doesn't sit in, in a bank account offsetting the Commonwealth's budget, which is what it is doing." End quote. That's what Mr Ward said, the, minister, the New South Wales Minister for Disability. Now, Mr Ward went on to say, there's a $1.6 billion sitting on the Commonwealth balance sheet that we want to spend on people with disabilities. End quote. Now, I also would like to remind um, colleagues, the $1.6 billion is part of the appropriation we voted to give the NDIA with the passage of the last budget. This $1.6 billion comes on top of the $4.6 billion underspend in the NDIS last financial year. 
a total over two years of $6.2 billion ripped from the NDIS to help the government manage their deteriorating budget position. Now, as Senator uh, Billick has uh, said in her contribution, quite rightly, this is a cruel and heartless in the extreme. This latest $1.6 billion underspend on the NDIS will cause heartache and despair every day for the very people it was intended to help. People were living with a disability and missing out on care and support, all because this government is not putting, putting out there the measures that need to be uh, undertaken. And I mean, as I've already said, lifting the sta staffing cap, acting on recommendations, in fact, of a very good uh, committee, um, a bipartisan committee on the uh, Joint Standing Committee of NDIS, who have put uh, recommendations forward, the unanimous recommendations forward, which need to be acted upon by this government, that will help to reduce some of the delays, uh, some of the um, issues around um, plan, bu plan building, um, uh, the in trying to get, of course, um, equipment uh, for people, and also what we see now, which is causing a huge uh, delays, is the fact that there isn't the um, professional workforce available, in, and what I'm talking about is uh, allied health professionals. We don't have uh, enough allied health professionals that are able to do the work that they have to do prior to uh, the participant going out and sourcing, whether it be you know, a bed or uh, a chair or whatever piece of equipment they've been um, they've been able to source through their plan. And this is a real, a real issue. And we have not yet seen anything really from this government that's going to seek to um, fix those issues. Now, as I've already said, the New South Wales government have highlighted their concern that it will be the people with disability in regional areas and Indigenous Australians and those from culturally and linguistically um, diverse backgrounds that will miss out on support and services thanks to the withholding of this $1.6 billion. Uh, We've only seen, um, just, just this week actually, uh, in my home state of Tasmania, where it's been revealed that um, New Horizons, which is based in Mowbray in the seat of Basques, um, the um, Brid Ms. Brid Ms. Um, Archer's uh, seat was um, unsuccessful in its bid for funding under the NDIS uh, ILC grant scheme. Even though you know, there were, I think there were 300 um, applications, and uh, but only, and 28 were successful. But of course, none in uh, Tasmania. And this is New Horizons has been there for th um, more than three decades, doing a wonderful job, leading the way in inclusive sport and recreation. But as I've said when I first started uh, my contribution, the Labor Party will always highlight issues around the NDIS. The NDIS is a transformative um, scheme. It is transforming people's lives, and we need to ensure that the funds that have been set aside for the NDIS are used for the NDIS and not used to prop up the federal government's budget. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this matter of public importance, and I do so with a great deal of pride. And uh, I'd like to just comment on a couple of comments that Senator Brown has just made in her contribution. And I really take issue with Senator Brown and the particularly disgraceful comment that she made that ministers in our government couldn't wait to hand over their job. I think that's a shocking reflection 
on the commitment of our government and ministers, including myself when I was the Assistant Minister for Disability Services, Housing and Social Services. And I did that job with a great deal of pride and I did it with a great deal of honour. And I was very sad when I was not able to continue as the Assistant Minister. And for Senator Brown to reflect on ministers in that way is I really do think that she should come back into the chamber and withdraw that comment. And when I was the Assistant Minister, Madam Acting Deputy President, I was incredibly proud to stand up for people with a disability, to stand up for their families and their carers and everyone in their world to make sure that they had a better life, that they could be the very best that they could be. And one of the most significant reforms that happened when I was the Assistant Minister was our reform of the Special Disability Accommodation Allowance, which wasn't being included in uh, people's packages. So people were being left in a situation where they could not go out and seek accommodation because they didn't know what sort of resources they had, and that just seemed to be completely the wrong way around, and we fixed that. And uh, I don't think I probably had a better day as the Assistant Minister when I joined Kirby Littley and her family when she moved into her new home in Belmont in Geelong. And there was such a sense of joy and we are seeing that joy all around the nation. These are people who previously had nowhere to live, whose parents and families were racked with grief, not knowing what would happen to their children. And now through the SDA, as but one example, which supports those who have the highest needs, around about 6 per cent of all people who have a disability. Uh, this is absolutely transformative. Uh, so I say I'm incredibly proud of the work that we are doing in delivering the NDIS. And that is not to say, and I do acknowledge the contribution of Senator Steelejohn, that is not to say uh, that there have not been problems. Yes, there have been problems. There have been challenges. There have been too much bureaucracy at times, but our government, led by our Prime Minister, has been single-minded in our determination to improve the NDIS, to make sure Australians with a disability get what they deserve by way of support and services and funding, and to ensure that as a nation that we can hold our heads up high, because this is a world-first social insurance scheme. And I want to pay tribute to all Australians with a disability, their parents like Senator Hughes and their carers and of course all the workers in the disability sector who play such an important role. And I will put on record that uh, before the election uh, it was very disappointing that the current member for Corangamite, Ms Coker, uh, drove around in a trailer saying how she was going to put the heart back in the NDIS. And it was a very embarrassing and, frankly, low political act to be trying to use people with a disability to make a point, uh, obviously attacking me. And I think and I regret today that we cannot celebrate with a sense of bipartisanship uh, what we are doing on both sides of the chamber. And on the point that Senator Steelejohn has made about the scheme that was uh, being rushed, and yes, it was rushed. It basically began on the 1st of July 2013, one year before it was meant to, and it was rushed because the then Prime Minister Julia Gillard wanted to roll the scheme out a few months before the federal election. And I want to correct a very important statement that Senator Steelejohn made. There was absolute bipartisanship. Uh, Tony Abbott, when he was the opposition leader, and uh, the Liberal opposition was absolutely and utterly committed to rolling out the NDIS. And I want to put that very strongly on the record and to correct what Senator Steelejohn said. Of course, we are here because there is more politicking over the NDIS, and I do very strongly reject uh, the premise for this MPI. Um, and that is that the Morrison government has always been committed to fully funding the NDIS 
And it's obviously very clear that the Labor Party does not understand, except the member for Barton, I do acknowledge uh, her concession, that this is a demand-driven system. The money is there and it is provided for so that it can be drawn down as required. And that, unfortunately, is the inconvenient truth which undermines the motion before the Senate today. So what we are seeing is an increase in the NDIS budget as it is rolled out across the nation from $13.3 billion in 2018-19 to $18 billion in 1920, and of course, full scheme, $22 billion, which is no less than what Labor would commit to, of course, if it was in government. Uh, so, as I say, this is just some really regrettable uh, politicking. The NDIS under our government has evolved into the largest and fastest social reforms, one of the most significant social reforms in our history. There are now nearly 340,000 Australians benefiting from the NDIS. And of course, since um, as at the 31st of December, uh, there are now another 134,000 people receiving disability supports for the first time, 40 per cent of the total number of participants. So we are rolling out the NDIS at a very uh, rapid rate. We're also listening, and when things are not working, and that was certainly the experience uh, when I was the assistant minister, we are listening and fixing the things that. Uh, are not working, such as lifting the staff cap, and so we certainly took very strong action to lift the staff cap. The COAG NDIS quarterly report found that the average wait time for children aged up to six years to meet NDIS access had reduced from 43 days in June 2019 to an average of less than three days in December 2019. So yes. Uh, there was a problem with children waiting too long, but we got in there and we fixed it. And we have worked very hard to reduce the waiting time on the plans, and we've also worked very hard to reduce issues such as when someone wants to amend their plan and, of course, when someone wants to um, access assistive technology without going through having to get a number of quotations. So lots of bureaucracy which hampered the NDIS at an earlier stage. Our government is now tackling, of course, under uh, our new minister, very much led by the Prime Minister, and we are doing that with um, a great deal of um, pride. But as I say, Madam Acting Deputy President, through schemes like the SDA, uh, we are changing lives and we are making the most substantial contribution by way of committing $22 billion at full scheme rollout uh, by 2021-22. Uh, that money is there. That money is provided for in the budget. And just look at the converse argument. Imagine if we did not provide more money than was required in the, in the budget. There would be a shortfall. So being a demand-driven scheme, if there wasn't a surplus amount of money in the provision for NDIS drawdowns, then there would be a shortfall. Our government is not going to allow that ha to happen. And uh, as I say, that money is there. It can be drawn down when required. And the faster the scheme rolls out, the more quickly the drawdown occurs. So this is one of the many ways in which uh, we are supporting Australians, and we're doing it, Madam Acting Deputy President, because we are running our budget responsibly. We are making sure that through 29 years of continued economic growth, low unemployment, lower taxes, fixing Labor's mess that we inherited, its spiral of debt and deficit, that we are running the budget responsibly, and we are doing so that we can so we can stand up for so many Australians who have a disability and provide all the other services that make Australians' lives all the better. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. The it's interesting to hear the comments from um, Senator Henderson. Uh, 1.6 billion dollars underspent. Numerous examples of poor performance of uh, the program of the NDIS because of being underfunded, under-resourced. Uh, staff freezes, 
uh, third-term government managing this, and yet we're still seeing consistently problems with the NDIS and how it's performing. And yet we see the government is using some of Australia's most vulnerable people, people living with disabilities, as an accounting trick to convince the Australian people it has a budget surplus. Leaving aside the question of whether this government, through its economic mismanagement, does or does not have a surplus, the fact remains there is a currently a $1.6 billion sitting on the Commonwealth balance sheet. That is $1.64 billion, 4.6. Oh, I'm sorry, corrected, $4.6 billion that states have been told they cannot access, so they can fund people with disabilities to have access to essential services. It came from underspending on the NDIS, underspending in layman's language when we're talking about billions of dollars. The government is supposed to spend on people with disabilities, but it's now apparently using it to actually balance its books, using disability people, people with, with dire need and support from our community. In actual fact, as previous senators on the other side have said, this was an initiative that the government of the, uh, the opposition at the time and the government at the time came to a consensus on. But I, I, I can remember back to those negotiations and those arguments. I can remember when Tony Abbott was brought kicking and screaming to the table. And the reason why is because good thinking people of all politics outside their party, outside the Liberal Party, including people that voted for them, turned around and said what Labor was proposing made sense. It gave people respect and it gave them an opportunity to look after their families and have some assurance about their families into the future. Now do we see what they're doing? Now we see them turning around and doing budgetary tricks. And it's not just Labor who are angry at, about this government hobbling the futures of people who just want to go about their lives and be the best they can be. New South Wales Liberal Minister Gareth Ward, who himself is visually impaired, has blown the whistle on his own side. They haven't, they haven't answered that argument yet, have they? They haven't answered the argument that's been put forward by one of their own, a senior minister in the New South Wales government, a Liberal minister, who said, people who sit in a room all day with no support looking at the four walls and talked about the cruelness of this government holding on to its money. That's not my words. That's not Labor's words. That is one of their own saying how devastated they are by the lack of action and the inappropriate steps and lack of appropriate steps by this government. The minister has gone public with stories of despair of people who desperately need speech therapy or occupational therapy to be able to live in a full and dignified life and simply cannot get it. That's the Morrison government is calling this denial of funding an underspend in the first place is a disgrace. We all know how Scott Morrison and Stuart Robert have mismanaged the NDIS system. And don't believe it because I'm saying it, because one of their own is saying it. In actual fact, even more importantly, people with disability and their carers are saying it. Like my, my office, like many others, have received so many representations from constituents who have been affected by the callous and inhumanity of this government. We received correspondence about a Meals on Wheels service who had booked twenty dollars to $30,000 worth of work supplying meals for high-need individuals. They were left high and dry for 18 months. NDIA was not paying them, and they ended up basically supplying meals to hungry and vulnerable people at a loss, limiting the reach of, the, of their program. Then we had representations from the father of a young man, who we will, we will call Jack with several disabilities, including being completely blind. He had been given less than a third of the funding he actually needed to have any semblance of a normal life. Jack did everything he could to, that he was required of the NDIS. He had a comprehensive plan prepared for him by an approved not-for-profit NDIS provider. The plan provided for all of his disabilities. It was holistic and comprehensive, taking into account his carer's needs, his carers being his mother and father. Instead of funding the comprehensive plan, the NDIS funded less than one-third of it. 
The funding ran out in last December last year, and Jack has been at home since then. He cannot use a phone or feed himself. His father has to had to take the last month off work to relieve his mother because Jack feels unsafe without having somebody there with him. He, in fact, was learning to use the phone with the funding that he previously had that was cut off. But funding for those lessons were cut now two years ago. He was told the NDAA can only see him as being blind and cannot see him as other disabilities such as autism, OECD and anxiety, despite having submitted reports from both a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Thank you very much, Senator Sheldon. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, to make a contribution in this debate. And can I say from the outset how ruthless, shonky and dishonest is this government? That's what the Australian people have come to realise since the election. They have been taken for a ride by this government. In the last two days, the people of northern Tasmania, my home state, have learned that this government has denied disability support and recreation organisation New Horizon NDIS grant funding. Now we know the track record of those on the opposite side of how shonky their grants program are. But to have New Horizon, who actually change people's lives, they improve people's well-being, and the fact that the Morrison government is unwilling to support this organisation beggars belief. It really does. I question the humanitarian humanitarian of this government that will not be assisting, will not be funding an organisation that helps people live a respectful and better life. Under the NDIS Information Linkage and Capacity Grant Scheme, 28 grants were issued. And you might ask, how many of them went to Tasmania? Well, I can tell you it was zero. That's what it was, zero to my home state of Tasmania. This news has gutted New Horizons. And it's also gutted the northern Tasmanian community. Because this funding black hole will not disappear unless the federal government does the right thing by the people of northern Tasmania. And I expect and I know people of northern Tasmania expect that the federal member for Bass would do more than just write a letter to Minister Stuart Robert. I mean, with all due respect, she's a member of the government. She should be banging on the Prime Minister's door. She should be banging on Stuart Roberts' doors, demanding a better outcome for her electorate. Now, what we've seen from the local member is a report we've read in the local newspaper that she will or has written to the minister. Well, New Horizons, just in case she's not aware of what New Horizon does in northern Tasmania, it actually provides meaningful and physical and social activities for over 462 people with a disability in northern Tasmania. Well, Bass is a marginal seat, so as a marginal seat member of the House of Representatives, you would think she would be in there fighting to retain her seat. Those votes alone would change the member for Bass at the next federal election. Now, you, you Horizon is based in uh, Mowbray, and it's actually been in existence since 1986. I've had a long association over my various roles that I've had before I came to this place. Now, people with a disability deserve the support of their federal government. But the funding that New Horizon and how they use it goes beyond just physical and social activities. It actually prevents social isolation associated with disability. And there is a crucial need for this important work to continue. It also plays a crucial role in building more inclusive communities. Now, we read, as I said, we've read in the local paper that the Liberal state government is going to contact the federal government over this decision. Well, whoopee-doo, whoopee-doo. 
It's a marginal seat. I can't believe the federal member hasn't been already banging on the Prime Minister's door. We have a federal and state Liberal government that aren't even talking to each other. So I call on the federal member for Bass, who doesn't like to be accountable for the decisions of the federal government, to actually be a voice, be a strong voice for those people who need her to be from the disability sector and from our local community. I'd have to question, yet again, of 28 grants, I just find it hard to believe and I'm only speaking about one organisation in Tasmania, New Horizon. But what about the other organisations in Tasmania that have missed out? And I wonder, is this another sports rort? How was the grants actually determined? Was it also done on marginal seats or targeted seats? Was it colour coded? I mean, I would really like those sort of details to come before us. But the important thing is that we know that this government has never really been fair dinkum when it comes to the NDIS and funding it. We know they've used it to prop up their budgets. Well, the Australian people and people with disabilities in my home state deserve so much better, so much better. Now, we know that they've, uh, this government ripped out $4.6 billion out of the NDIS to prop up their Clayton's uh, surplus, while agency executives have been given huge bonuses. How is that fair? Massive delays and institutional malaise have seen more than 1,200 Australians with disabilities die while waiting for the NDIS package. It's a bit like the home care packages. There's 30,000 older Australians who have died in the last two years. This is not a very good track Thank record. You, and Senator you Polly, your be time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Acting Deputy. Oh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, I think that I want to call this speech what happened while you weren't watching, because there are so many Australians who are out there trying to do the very best they can with their life, particularly people who are caring for those with disability. And while every hour of their day is spent on caring and advocating for someone they love with a disability, this government went through the most extraordinarily uh, deceptive set of motions to take money away from people with disability to the tune of $4.6 billion. They euphemistically called it an underspend, and then they decided to shuffle it off to the side to try and balance their books, to balance their books on the back of people with a disability. This is an absolute disgrace. I wholeheartedly endorse the comments of my fellow senator from New South Wales, Senator Sheldon, who revealed that the Liberal government in New South Wales is well and truly alive to the problems of this federal government and its deceptions around the matter of disability. To the contribution from Senator Polly from Tasmania, who put on the record in the closing moments of her speech the fact that 1,200 people have died while waiting for a package to give them some support on NDIS. I can, I'd like to let this chamber know about a remarkable group of people with whom I walked on Sunday at Gough Whitlam Park in Earlwood. I found out about this particular group by a great leader in the trade union movement in New South Wales, uh, Graeme Kelly, who's the head of the USU union. 30,000 members got information from Mr Kelly and 20 of his executives walked with him, having decided that they would support the Save Our Sons Duchenne Foundation in their quest to try and give a decent life to young uh, boys in particular, but some girls, who have been diagnosed with Duchenne's, uh, a, a motor neurone disorder that sees uh, young people who reach about the age of five or six suddenly present with muscular difficulties that very, very much limit their lives without adequate support. I want to pay respect to Mr Kelly for the leadership that he's showing there and his executive and his commitment to try and help this community. But the reason that help is being wrapped around by charitable work is because this government has failed every test of the rollout of the NDIS. I want to acknowledge Ellie and uh, Nancy Ede, who set up the Save Our Sons Foundation in 2008, 
and their son Emilio, who they are caring for. I also want to acknowledge Ma uh, Michael Galderizzi, who is a general manager, who is outraged and was shocked, in fact. Many of the parents were so shocked to find out that the reason that their kids are waiting for vitally needed resources, including wheelchairs, is because this government set up so many barriers and impediments to them that they couldn't access the care they need for their children. There are families that I walked with on Sunday who despairingly talked about the next round of participant planning that they are going to be forced to do every year. Every single one of those parents who spoke to me was really very, very concerned about the permanent erosion of any support that they might receive. They talked about a completely untrained workforce, about somebody being sent to them by this government and not enough sent because they had a cap on it, somebody ill-prepared, ill-educated, sent to them to create a plan that didn't even acknowledge the needs of the illness. So ill-prepared were they that they didn't even know what the disease was or what the real needs of the young person were. Parents fighting a system that was organised by this government, constructed by this government, but not delivered to the people of Australia. Rather, they used it as an ATM, a bank machine, to get cash to prop up a headline where they wanted to declare a surplus. Well, we cannot believe a word they say, because while Australians, ordinary, hard-working Australians who want to believe in some of the things that we heard Senator Henderson say, who want to believe that this government will look after people with disabilities, they have been failed, because while they weren't watching and Thank living you, their Senator lives, this Your government has, has let expired. them down. The time for the discussion on the matter of public importance has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents.